Good afternoon. My name is Crystal Dahl, and I am the Online Communications Specialist here at Meritas. I would like to welcome and thank each of you for joining us on today's webinar, California's Prohibition Against Non-Compete Agreements. I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Donald Rez. Don is a shareholder with Sullivan Hill, Lewin, Rez, and Engel, the San Diego, California Meritas affiliate. He focuses his practice area in business and commercial litigation and antitrust and trade regulation. He has handled all types of commercial lawsuits involving trade regulation and antitrust, breach of contracts including covenants not to compete, professional malpractice, and intellectual property. His antitrust experience has involved claims of virtually every kind. He has written extensively and has published articles in various legal, legal journals, has co-authored articles for the American Bar Association's Forum Committee on Franchising, and has co-edited issues of the ABA's Antitrust Law Journal. Don has also presented and lectured at numerous sem seminars. Before we get started, I would like to quickly go over a few housekeeping items. Meritas now offers the ability to listen to our webinars through your computer speakers. If you have any difficulty hearing the presentation, you may also call into the associated telephone line instead. All phone lines will be muted. If you experience any technical difficulties, please press star zero at any time to connect with the support technician. You may also use the chat feature on the screen um, to connect with me and I can troubleshoot with you as well. If you have any questions, you are welcome to ask via the chat feature found on the left-hand side of your screen. Don will answer all questions at the end of his presentation. Lastly, in the next few days I will distribute a copy of the presentation, a recording of the webinar, as well as Don's contact details. With that, Don, are you ready to get started? I am. Thank you. Great. So, good morning or to those of you to my um, right on the east of California, good afternoon. We're going to talk today about non-compete clauses in California, California's prohibition against them, the protection of trade secrets, and the practical relationship between the two some, with some thoughts um, as to how the law is evolving in this area. So the last couple of years, covenants not to compete have been making the news. And because of their increasing popularity um, and, and the notoriety, I think that there's increasing confusion, um, especially among those who aren't in California but have employees in California, those, those employers that are based in, in Delaware, for example. In February, the Washington Post ran an article entitled The Rise of the Non-Compete Agreement from Tech Workers to Sandwich Makers with a subtitle of Companies Keep Their Employees from Leaving for the Competition with Surprising Regularity. In that article, the, the author said that one in four workers have been subjected to a non-compete signed it at one time, and one, or one out of eight are currently bound by one. According to the Wall Street Journal in an article two years ago, quoting statistics from 2010, 79% of chief, chief executive employees' contracts have non-compete. The New York Times in an article last June entitled Non-Compete Clauses Increasingly Pop Up in an Array of Jobs, stated that, and I quote, non-compete clauses are now appearing in far-ranging fields beyond the world of technology, sales, and corporations with tightly held secrets where the curbs have traditionally been used, from event planners to chefs to investment fund managers to yoga instructors employees are increasingly required to sign agreements that prohibit them from working for a company's rivals. So there's an old story that used to kind of circulate about a proprietor of a full-service watch store 
who bought a cheaper brand of watches for $10 each and sold them at retail for $10. So how do you make a living doing that, he was asked. He responded, on the repairs. I think there's a serious danger, at least in California, that those lawyers who have California-based employees sign non-competes with their clients will make the bulk of their profits on litigation. So let's move forward and get to what kind of focus on what it is we're talking about. What is a covenant not to compete? Well, it's pretty simple and straightforward. Covenant not to compete, also known as a non-compete clause, is an agreement in which one party agrees not to work for the other party's competition, perhaps in a specified area for a certain period of time. They can be found in employment contracts, which is what we're going to focus on today. Um, and they can also be found in contracts for the sale of a business. And I'll just briefly touch on that. In a, in a couple of minutes. So from the kind of what of a co covenant not to compete, part of what makes up the what of a covenant not to compete is the why of a covenant not to compete. And typically, covenants not to compete are designed to prevent employees from going to work for a competitor or starting their own business. And the theory behind it is that such former employees have a competitive advantage by knowing and perhaps exploiting confidential information about their former employer's operations or trade secrets or sensitive information such as customer lists, business practices, etc. The, the sensitive information has included such things as price lists, pricing decision contacts within customers, or even really just the cachet that comes from a resume showing past experience or expertise. One of the concerns in California has been that co these competitive advantages, quote unquote, are really the natural result of experience gained in the area. Many, in fact most, would not be considered trade secrets. So here's just one example of an agreement not to compete. You skip down to the middle. This is kind of what we're focusing on. It's a very stripped down covenant which bars an employee, a former employee, not to compete with the company for a period of time, usually one, two, or three years, from the date of termination of his or her employment in a geographic area, which can be defined as um, in mileage from, from where the employee formerly worked or from the company's headquarters. And I've seen them defined as counties within a state, and I've even seen them defined as states or even regions within the United States. Specific exemplar of such a covenant can be found in the key California Supreme Court decision, Edwards versus Arthur Anderson, I'm just going to read to you what that covenant not to compete was. If you leave the firm for 18 months after release or resignation, you agree not to perform professional services of the type you provided for any client on which you worked during the 18 months prior to release or resignation. This does not prohibit you from accepting employment with a client, for 12 months after you leave the firm, you agree not to solicit or perform professional services of the type you provided any client of the offices to which you were assigned during the 18 months preceding release or resignation. You agree not to solicit away from the firm any of its professional personnel for 18 months after release or resignation. That's kind of a typical covenant not to compete. So back to the why, the real purpose of the covenant not to compete is to exclude competition. And the reason for it is that it, it's a bright red line. Um, it's a much better 
better tool than a non-disclosure agreement or trade secret agreement because there's a bright red line. It's easy to enforce. It doesn't require um, a showing of misappropriation of trade secrets, for example, which, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, is, is not as simple a concept as, you know, this guy used to be my employee. He signed a covenant not to compete. He's competing for him, which is the fundamental of a um, lawsuit to enforce a covenant not to compete. So clearly in the law throughout the United States, there are two competing concepts. The one is freedom of contract, and the other, which is also a powerful public policy, is the freedom to work. It can't really be argued that it's not sound public policy to encourage employees to seek better jobs from other employers or to go into business for themselves. And in most jurisdictions, in many jurisdictions, these competing policies require a balancing, often on a case-by-case -case basis. In California, however, there is a statute which pretty much supplies the answer. So here it is, sweet and very simple, the California Business and Professions Code Section 16600 void contracts. Every contract by which anyone is restrained from engaging in a lawful profession, trade, or business of any kind is to that extent void. California Supreme Court in the decision uh, involving the covenant not to compete I just read summarized by saying the California courts, this court, generally condemns non-competition agreements and pulls up a footnote from a previous case that says such restraints on trade are largely illegal. And to juxtapose um, the standard in other states with the California case that the Supreme Court in California in the earlier case noted that covenants not to compete are accepted legally in many jurisdictions. They're common in those jurisdictions, but in California, they are largely illegal. So we can state that California public policy uh, is every citizen retains the right to pursue any lawful employment and enterprise of their choice. And unlike many jurisdictions, any is an important concept in California. Now, I, I mentioned that in the, oh, so I was just, just going to mention that there's no rule of reason or balancing in this. The public policy is so powerful, you cannot contract the right away. And the Ninth Circuit earlier this month, actually, in a case entitled Golden v. California Emergency Physicians Medical Group, noted that in the Supreme Court decision in Edwards, the California Supreme Court reaffirmed the state's strong policy against restraints to professional practice and specifically disavowed even narrow exceptions that the federal courts had begun to fashion. And again, the Ninth Circuit noted that California's stringent rule departs from the more traditional approach of the common law. So we're dealing with California, a, a relatively unique California um, rule, not one that can necessarily be translated or inferred from the common law or what other states do. Now, covenants not to compete can be okay in the sale of a business, but only in conjunction with the sale of goodwill in, in the business. The concept is that
goodwill is the expectation of continued patronage. And if you sold that as an asset of the business and then started a business down the street, you're stealing back some of the goodwill that you sold. And that's why covenants um, not to compete are okay in the sale of a business when you're selling the goodwill of the business. So we're all real smart lawyers, we're clever, and we understand that there are jurisdictions which permit covenants not to compete. So we draft covenants not to compete that include a choice of law in a state where, and, and have that choice of law govern the contract in a state where covenants not to compete are lawful. But California's public policy overrides that don't allow out-of-state employer or competitor to limit employment and business opportunities in California. So even in a situation like that in the Saw v. Play Hut in case where an employee was asked, who was already hired and was told as a condition of continued employment they had to sign a non-compete, and they refused. Um, and the non-compete was governed by a foreign law. The California courts held that the employee who was terminated for refusal to sign the covenant not to compete had a wrongful termination claim against the employer. California law protects employees, and you can't overreach by trying to enforce a covenant not to compete, even if there's a choice of law that would permit it. Now, this does create something of a problem if the employer files a lawsuit in another state and the employee files a debt relief claim in California. Comedy will preclude California from enjoining the employer from pursuing the out-of-state lawsuit, and full faith and credit will make the first final judgment prevail. But ordinarily, even an out-of-state um, court should apply California law in a, in a choice of law analysis, which involves California employees, even if there's a choice of law provision in, in the employee's contract. An example of that is in the case um, Ascension Insurance Holdings v. Robert Underwood. But that doesn't we're not quite through with the analysis. In the Arthur Anderson case, the California Supreme Court noted that there's still an issue as to whether there's a trade secret exception to Section 16600. So properly restated, the public policy of the state of California is that former employee has the right to engage in a competitive business for himself and to enter into competition with his former employer, even for the business of those who had formerly been the customers of his former employer, provided such competition is fairly and legally conducted. So we don't that brings into, into play the issue of the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. So we know what the we know the Uniform Trade Secrets Act in California, Civil Code Section 3426, et cetera. We know that trade secrets are defined in a specific way, um, requiring the, a, a formula pattern or compilation, and this word compilation often is extended into areas that you would not have ordinarily 
thought of as a trade secret, such as, um, as we'll discuss in a minute, a uh, customer list. It that derives independent economic value and is a subject of efforts that are reasonable under the circumstances, maintain secrecy, and the misappropriation of trade secrets is prescribed and may be enjoined or compensated in damages and um, attorney's fees may be awarded. So, restating the public policy by including the Edwards footnote is that Enforcement of a non-solicitation agreement in California is prohibited in all cases in which the trade secret exception does not apply. Now, there's some dispute as to whether the, this trade secret um, concept is really an exception to the 16600 rule, or it's you know an independent by means of this concept of on unfair competition. I don't think it really matters. The analysis will be the same. So as we move into this concept, the, the point that many courts have not yet really focused on is that the fact of the matter is most employees don't really have access to traditional uh, trade secrets. They don't know the formula to the secret sauce or to the Coca-Cola formula. But it has become an issue, even a major caveat to the California public policy, because of the notion that customer lists can constitute trade secrets. Numerous employees have contacts with customers or key sources of supply and have um, and have the potential of attracting those customers. This threatens to be the exception which swallows the California public policy rule. So we've seen some courts kind of find the concept. Critically, it's not the solicitation of former employees of, of, the, uh, of former um, customers of the former employee, it's instead the misuse of trade secret information which can be enjoined. So customer lists can be broadly defined or it can be more narrowly defined. So in this case, it included the identity of the customer, the names of the customer's decision maker, and customer-specific information, such as equipment needs, order history, and equipment pricing. Courts have found that that kind of information is certainly possible to be a trade secret, but it requires a fact-intensive, fact-specific analysis. And a serious concern to that is that it raises the question of enforcement of a covenant not to compete in the guise of a customer list. This is particularly true given today's technology where information can be found on the internet concerning most customers. Um, it really is, is a dubious to say in many situations that a customer list is a trade secret. Certainly it can be a trade secret, but I've gotten letters addressed to clients asserting that a salesman making a generic call on a former employer's customers was actionable, even though the very customers being contacted were listed on the website as customers of the former employer. The concern in California is that the threat of litigation against a former employee or a startup company or even a more established competitor can be very coercive and can undermine the, the fundamental protections 
that 16600 provides in California. So what happens when an employee has had to sign a non-compete, admits that customers are, quote, trade secret customer lists are, quote, trade secrets as frequently is set forth in the non-compete agreement, and the ex-employer threatens or actually does sue. Well, there are, I've listed six possible um, additional protections for employees that are designed to protect the California public policy, allowing employees to freely move from job to job. First is that California appellate courts have started developing this concept of an overbroad claim of trade secrets and therefore striking as a result the entire covenant not to compete. Secondly, California courts have developed the concept that there's no inevitable disclosure, so the mere fact that the former employee has ac had access to trade secrets does not mean that they're going to be used um, by the new employer. There's also the possibility of a couple of additional, uh, a couple of affirmative claims that could be brought against an employer, a former employer, seeking to enforce a covenant not to compete. One is that that enforcement action itself, it, not the enforcement action itself, but the because of the anti-slap implications, but that having had an employee sign a covenant not to compete was an unfair business practice under Business and Professions Code Section 17200, or it, it was a labor code violation, and we're going to get into both of those a little bit more. Trade Secret Act itself may provide a little bit of, of protection, and then um, there's the possibility of an antitrust claim being asserted by the former employee and or his new employer. So overbroad trade secret provisions. In Kalani v. Gluska, the California Appellate Court noted that the covenant not to compete was not narrow, did not restrict only competition relating to the theft of trade secrets. Rather, it involved commercially unreasonable conduct. It was it was a very broad covenant not to compete. And the court said it was not going to rewrite the covenant to only affect that which could have been legal in a covenant not to compete. It would be an undermining of, this, of Section 16600 to allow such rewriting of overbroad covenants. Here's the concern. Employers could insert broad, facially illegal covenants not to compete in their employment contracts. Most, probably most, employees would honor these clauses without consulting counsel or challenging the clause in court, thus directly undermining the statutory policy favoring competition. Employers would have no disincentive to use the broad illegal clauses if permitted to retreat to a narrow lawful construction in the event of litigation. So the powerful coercive effect on a California employee to have a covenant not to compete is which may not be enforceable in California, but most employees don't know that. And so it's become a practice to have employees sign a covenant not to compete, even if the employer knows that they're not enforceable in California. It, a second case recognizing the, the problem is the Zabi Playhut case. And even in a 16601 context, the sale of a partnership or the sale of a corporate interest where goodwill was being sold, where the parties 
agreed to an overbroad covenant not to solicit, and here it was a mutual um, agreement not to solicit former employees of the buyer as well as the seller, the court refused to blue pencil into a more narrow um, covenant not to compete in the strategic LTD v. Info Crossing West case at 142 Calap 4th, 1068. It's pretty clear there is no blue pencil rule in California as the um, court in 2009 in Dow v. Biosense said, we also reject Biosense's argument that the trial court failed to interpret the clauses in such a way to make them lawful. Any attempt to construe the non-compete and non-solicitation clauses in such a manner as to make them lawful would not benefit contract correct a mistake, but rather to save an unlawful agreement. So the court refused and has refused to blue pencil cases or blue pencil covenants not to compete. If the covenant not to compete purports to secure only trade secrets and it limits itself to securing trade secrets, um, then it's probably okay. But if it says, for example, among other things, confidential information, et cetera, then it'll probably be stricken um, under these lines of cases. It raises an interesting couple of issues. Does an illegally overbroad covenant not to compete allow a former employer, a former employee to compete tortiously? That is, if there is an overbroad covenant not to compete, and it's stricken by the court, but the employee has in fact utilized trade secrets, will where will the court land up land on that? Will it say, look, Mr. Employer, you overreached, you lost your trade secrets protection? Or will it instead say, look, you are not protected at all by the covenant not to compete, but it's an independent wrong to utilize trade secrets, to misappropriate trade secrets, and will enforce that statute, will enforce that statute, that is the, the Trade Secrets Act, notwithstanding that you overreached in your covenant not to compete. It seems to me that the covenant not to compete as it relates to trade secrets um, and cutting it down doesn't really do a lot to remedy the interorum effect if, in fact, the tort kind of dichotomy is allowed if, the, if you throw out the, the covenant not to compete but continue to, to uh, enforce the trade secrets under the separate statute. So there needs to be something else to remedy this interorum effect that an unenforceable covenant not to compete has on em former employees. But it also seems to me that the concept of unfair competition is not to be protected under 16600, and therefore it's more likely that a court would separately say you're not going to be um, allowed to steal trade secrets and compete using trade secrets. That's a question that's still kind of up in the air. So another way that California has either purposely or unintentionally provided protection against lawsuits seeking to restrain a, a, a former employee from competing is that before any discovery can take place in a trade secret claim, the one claiming to have trade secrets has to define them 
with reasonable particularity. And while the California courts are a little unclear as to how much particularity is required, you know, the better view is that you don't hold a mini trial on the issue of, of whether or not the trade secret has been particularly stated enough. I think in the, concept, in, in the context of an employee taking trade secrets and, and misappropriating trade secrets, that this, this statute will provide some protection to the employee. As the courts have noted, the, the purpose is, in fact, to help discourage the filing of meritless claims. Another concept that has been adopted in California courts, which should limit the exposure of former employees to covenants not to compete, asserting a trade secret misappropriation, is that there is the, the concept, the doctrine of inevitable disclosure has been firmly rejected in California. There is no right to an injunction against the use of trade secrets, only an injunction, I'm sorry, there is no right to an injunction restricting employment, only the right to an injunction against the misappropriation of trade secrets. The fact that you've gone into business with a competitor of your former employer does not mean that you will use trade secrets um, in the, in your, for your new employer. And in fact, in San Diego, there was a high profile case where one golf company hired the president of another golf company. The first golf company was in the business of, of or in the process of coming up with new golf balls and all sorts of new products. And they filed a lawsuit to include the, their competitor from employing their ex-president and, and the doctrine of inevitable disclosure since he had not, they could not show that he had used any of their, or misappropriated any of their trade secrets, the, their, they lost on their attempt to get an injunction. And the language used by the California court is about as strong as you can get. California law concerning enforcement of non-competition agreements, not the inevitable disclosure doctrine, will measure the covenant's scope, meaning, and validity. Here's another more recent example of a case where the non, no inevitable disclosure doctrine applied. So two other areas that council need to be aware of is that there are, in fact, the possibility of affirmative claims should overbroad covenants not to compete be forced upon California employees. First of all, it's a, it may be a form of unfair competition to require employees to sign um, covenants not to compete at all. And in fact, there are cases which have held that an employer's use of an illegal non-compete agreement violates Section 17200. This other concept, well, there, going, going back to 17200, 17200 has for many years been a great concern of, of out of state counsel. Um, but in California, we know that, that 17200 has some limitations. While it's easy to prove or easier to prove a violation of 17200, its teeth are, in most contexts, 
not very sharp. It only provides for equitable relief, either injunctions or, in certain circumstances, restitutionary um, disgorgement. There's no damages provision that goes with it, although restitutionary disgorgement can sometimes require the payment of money. There's, there's no attorney's fee provision ordinarily available um, in a 17200 violation. This next statute, which is a labor code provision, I find as a potential affirmative claim very intriguing. It precludes employers from requiring any employee or applicant for employment to agree in writing to any term or condition which is known by such employer or agent be prohibited by law. So I've only found one case where this was directly addressed, and that was a case decided shortly before the Arthur Anderson case. And it was a federal court decision. And Judge Moskowitz, in writing a pre-Arthur Anderson opinion, the name of the case is BBV Mobility, Inc said that because Section 16600 rendered non-competes, quote, void, unquote, they were not, quote, prohibited by law as this statute um, requires. But again, in Arthur Anderson, California Supreme first of all, Judge Moskowitz also noted that Arthur Anderson was up on appeal um, and that his opinion was subject to to whatever the California Supreme Court said, although it wasn't specifically in this context that he said that. But in Arthur Anderson, California Supreme Court said such covenants not to compete are illegal. Um, and and just, to, just to remind you, there are two California Supreme Court cases that have said that. And then there are a number of other cases which have also said that in, in particular in, the, um, in conjunction with the 17200 claim in Dow v. Biosense, again, it says an employer's use of an illegal non-compete agreement violates 17200. So if, if these agreements are illegal, then I suggest to you that they violate Labor Code Section 432.5. And under PAGA, um, Labor Code Section 2699, attorney fees for the successful employee are provided. And PAGA in 2699.5 specifically includes Labor Code Section 432.5, that is, this unlawful terms and conditions provision. So this is something we had a case where the employer, an email sent back to a, a resisting employee, yes, I know that such agreements aren't enforceable in California. We want you to sign the contract anyway, including this um, non-compete. And we obviously had to settle that case. And, and then they brought, a, they brought an action to enforce the non-compete. And when those emails turned up, we quickly felt like um, we needed to settle that case before Labor Code Section 432.5 became implicated. Another provision that could be affirmatively used by an employee would be that portion of the um, trade secret statute in California, which allows the award of attorney's fees as a deterrent to specious trade secret claims. And finally, 
as to an affirmative claim, the possibility exists that where employers have agreed to respect each other's covenants not to compete, that they've engaged in an unlawful restraint of trade. And we see that specifically taking place in the NRA high-tech employee antitrust litigation, which has been involved in a rolling settlement. And I think they finally concluded the last of the settlements. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars have been paid by high-tech companies where they, um, on the back of Stephen Jobs, uh, had agreed not to pirate each other's high-tech engineers. You know, there really isn't. I mean, the, the Justice Department had brought an investigation and had determined that they were in violation of antitrust concepts, and this was a follow-on um, class action. The only case in, in state court in California that has addressed this issue is the Silguero v. Crete Guard case is at 187 Cal at 460. And there, what the court did was allow a claim by an employee against the former employer for wrongful termination against public policy, where the employer terminated the recent hirees um, as a result of an understanding with competitors that it would honor competitors on competes, but the court dismissed the state antitrust claim without giving much of an analysis. So that um, you know, is is my thoughts. I'm now looking there's there's a question. Um, it relates to 16600 as stating that covenant is, quote, is to that extent void and that confidentiality and provisions and employment contracts should be severable and remain enforceable in light of the language of 16600, and that it's pretty hard for an employee of an established, to establish standing to bring an action under 17200 given the requirement to show lost money or property as a result of the unfair competition, although employment has, and, and I understand that 17200 has that limitation now, not all class members have to meet that, and so all you have to do is find one employee who has been denied a job because of the non-compete, that I think is the kind of loss of money or property that would allow for standing, certainly it suggested in the two cases that I've seen so far um, that have upheld 17200 causes of action as against a demurrer. So, there's another question which reads, are employee anti-piracy provisions generally enforceable in California? I'm, I'm, I take it that what you're, what you're referring to, George, in that question is anti-piracy um, being anti-solicitation agreement where a, an, a former employer, a former employee has agreed not to attempt to solicit his former colleagues for a period of time. And while the answer isn't quite as clear, better reason cases to me seem to hold that no, anti-piracy provisions are not enforceable in California because they restrict the employment opportunities of the employees left behind, um, so that it's just another way of, of restricting employment, and that's kind of against the general public policy 
in the state of California. So one, one other question, unless, unless there are any other questions, um, that, oh, I'm getting another question that says, ask me about the Ninth Circuit decision in Golden that I, that I earlier refu referred to. So earlier this month, the Ninth Circuit in Golden v. California Emergency Physicians Medical Group applied Business and Professions Code Section 16600 outside of merely covenants not to compete in an employment contract context. Case involved settlement agreement, which provided that Dr. Golden would not be employable by the defendant, California Emergency Physicians Medical Group. But that group, you know, can kind of controls um, emergency medical providers throughout California, is aggressively gobbling up additional um, groups and, and engaging in contract rights to, to um, uniquely provide those services at, at institutions. And so Dr. Golden was concerned that such an agreement would effectively bar him from employment in California. And the Ninth Circuit said that's a legitimate concern and sent it back to the lower court. Thus, broadly expanding the Ninth Circuit's understanding of what um, Business and Professions Code Section 16600 means in California. So I see no further questions. James Miranda has, has pointed out that the Laurel Corp case did say that non-solicitation agreements are enforceable in California, but there have been several other cases that have taken a contrary view. The Laurel case, I, I do not believe, is particularly well-reasoned um, and I mean, we're get, this is an area of the law that is being um, developed even as we speak. I think California is moving further and further down the road. Loral predates um, by 20 years the Arthur Anderson decision. So Arthur Anderson specifically stated that it was not dealing with an anti-solicitation um, provision, but we're still seeing this area open up. So I think that concludes my presentation. I thank you all for, for uh, participating, and I hope you have a, a great um, rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. What a great job. It was such a pleasure having you um, speak with us today. Uh, before we sign off, I just wanted to remind each of you that I will be sending out an email in the next few days that will include Don's presentation um, as well as his contact details. So you can reach out to him directly if you have any further questions. Um, there will also be a recording of this webinar. Um, with that, thank you again for joining us today, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.